Well, welcome. This is, uh, most of you have been here before and used to the uh, Edgar Casey on talks that we have, and it's very much presenting the readings, which we will have tonight, uh, of course. But the, uh, the majority of this talk is going to be trying to visually show what, uh, what manifestations there are. There is a real connection, as I'll get into in a minute, between the spirit is the life, the mind is the builder, the physical is the result. That is an axiom that goes throughout many, many Casey readings, to be able to make it clear that everything starts in spirit, goes into the mental realm, so that you have like this force that goes into the mental realm through our mind and our will, almost like an architect designs plans that are on a piece of paper. Now you've gone into the mental realm and designed the plan on the piece of paper, and the physical being the result is when it goes, transfers from the mind onto the paper and finally winds up being an actual construction or building. So there are some very different stages that goes along with that. Very often they wind up talking about using uh, the analogy of water. That water can be in steam, in liquid, and in ice form. So if you were to think of that as being analogous to the spiritual, mental, <coughs> and physical realms, you'll have a good idea of where we're going with this in uh, God the Father and his manifestations. Uh, most of you know this, but please bear with me as I go through some of the things that you're used to hearing because we are showing these on, um, on YouTube, and we have close to 40,000 views of these. So it is uh, just an amazing thing to us that we have so many listening audience at home, and so I need to make sure that I'm explaining things for them as well. When you see the title of the talk, God the Father and His Manifestations, that's actually the title of an Edgar Casey book called A Search for God. And that is the title of a particular chapter. They have 24 of them in Search for God 1 and 2. And so that's the uh, information that we'll be covering this evening is that what's in that book, which is available through the ARE Press. Always have to put a disclaimer in there to let you know that uh, these are interpretations according to me, the gospel according to John Schroeder. And that uh, I, uh, one of the things that I always do is make available to you and to you online uh, the Edgar Casey readings that went into being able to put the presentation together this evening. I am not, repeat, not able to send out this PowerPoint. It's far too large. I have so many graphics, videos, moving images on here that I think it's 30 to 40 megabytes and you can't make it as an attachment. So sorry if you're used to being able to get that, I can't do it for this particular one, but I can send a version of it to you that has still images. And of course, this uh, video is always available to you online at uh, www.edgarcaseyaz for Arizona.org. So you're able to always uh, get them uh, pick up the live video from there. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Just to be sure we know, uh, remember I said we were talking about a Search for God readings. That's what the 262, the dash 50 means. It's the 50th reading in the series. And that date of April 22nd, 1934 is the date that the reading was given. So the seven up there at the top is indicating it's the seventh paragraph out of that reading. What is the purpose of this particular lesson being God the Father and his manifestations. Has it not been pointed out to those as they have followed that presented, that in this there may be seen or known to each as to how, <clears throat> when, and in what manner they as individuals may be conscious of the Spirit manifesting through them in material things. So as I said earlier, this is trying to tell the people that we're in group one and we're saying what is the purpose of this particular lesson and he comes back and talks about you need to become consciously aware of this the spirit is the life the mind is the builder the physical is the result <coughs> excuse me got a frog in my throat here so one of the things that the casey readings are very clear on is that the reason that we are here on earth, and these are going to be paraphrases, not quotes. The reason that we are here on earth is to learn how to play well with others. Apparently, we've forgotten how to do that somewhere along the way. We do it often, and then there are times that we don't. And so we're trying to make sure that we're able to play well with others and make sure that we treat everybody as a beloved member of our family in each and every case. 
The other thing, and this is what to me really separates the Edgar Cayce material from just about anything else I've, in, I've studied in my life, and that is that we are trying to find heaven here on earth. How many religions do you hear, if you're good here, then you will be able to go to heaven after you die, or whatever the circumstance may be? So that you leave here, and then you are able to achieve this, whatever heaven is, according to that particular train of thought. Edgar Casey is very clear on you, once you have got that, got the concept of what's going on, will be able to experience heaven right here on earth and not have to go anywhere. And yet, once you do that and experience heaven on earth, you're free to go anywhere you want in time, space, and consciousness throughout eternity. So it's a, it's a very much a reversal of what you're used to in other religions. And so I, want to, I wanted to make sure that if you follow my little notes myself down there, it's a, we definitely have to get clear on the fact that we are eternal souls that are having a temporary human experience here on the earth for our own good. In fact, I would call it like we're on time out right now. You go ahead and limit where we can go so we can't do too much damage until we learn how to play well with others. And the idea is how many people when they're here on the earth are thinking that they are these you know, frail humans that may or may not survive after the human body dies. And so what we're trying to do is to get very clear on we are eternal souls. We live in a childproof universe, which means you can't be hurt permanently. There isn't anything that we can do, say, think, act on that will permanently damage us. Now, we can put ourselves at risk as far as being out of harmony with God's loving ways, but that's our choice, not God's. And God is constantly trying to help us get back into his loving arms again. So once we're clear on who we are and that we are trying to play well with others, then we figure out how to make this lesson work in our lives. Now, <clears throat> these two graphics that you're seeing on here, I don't know if you can see from back there, this is where you have a real advantage if you're looking at this online because we take the time to go put these graphics real close up in the presentation on there so that they're able to get a good shot at it. But this is just an hourglass, like an egg timer with the yellow sand uh, passing through right there. This one's a little bit different because you can tell that it's magnetic iron filings. And I put it on its side just to be able to set it off from the other and it's going to help with an explanation I'm going to give in a minute. But you can tell that when the iron filings start to, since they're magnetized, when they start to uh, glop on top of each other there, it starts to have a physical manifestation of its own, according to the physical laws of the universe. Now, one of the things that I think has is, uh, is always been interesting to me is this concept that Jesus gave in the Bible that talks about that the, uh, that the way is narrow, straight and narrow, to be able to get to the kingdom of heaven. Well, what if I were to make this just a, uh, an analogy, if you will, of saying this is a non-manifest, this is everything that has to do with the non-manifest portion of God, and this, within the mind of God in which we live and move and have our being, is the manifest portion in which we have matter. So let's call this energy, E equals mc squared, or matter times mass times the uh, speed of light squared. So if you have energy on the top, and it doesn't have a physical manifestation, and then you have the physical manifestation if it passes from here to here, is, uh, is when you wind up having what we experience as three dimensions. Now, if you get trapped down here, enmeshed is a word that they use very often for what happens when we make selfish choices, we forget how to be able to go right back up into the upper area, into the energy. <clears throat> that is the straight and narrow path that Jesus is talking about. How do you get there? It isn't that we are limited, because it sounds like, oh my gosh, how in the world do I ever, you know, just walk this straight and narrow path for eternity? No, not at all. You have this infinite possibilities of what you're able to accomplish, not only down here, but up there, but to be able to freely pass back and forth between the two, you have to have that Christ consciousness, that mind of God, in order to be able to do that. And so that's the straight and narrow path. If you have everything together in the Christ consciousness as Jesus did, you can freely pass from here to here, going back and forth. And once you get there, that's without limitation. Now, here's another uh, going to God the Father as manifestation. Let's imagine for a moment that we have 
uh, that this is the top, as you'd see over there, only it's shifted to the side. But think of this as being all of the non-manifest universe. This is the manifest universe. And I'm going to show you the analogy of how it works here. This is pure energy. This is where energy turns into visible light, like photons. And this is where the photons, I guess uh, science calls that tired light, where photons actually slow down and become physical matter in the world. So you take energy, it turns into the light, and then the light itself, the photons turn into physical matter within the manifest universe. And so instead of it just looking at it as a spiritual concept over there in which we're able to travel back and forth between the manifest and non-manifest realms to be able to work in, over here we're talking about that the light, as in God said, let there be light, this is all there was up until that point, said, let there be light, here's light, and then the manifest universe came into being along with that. Believe me, I am very open to anybody asking questions along the way as we go. I know how heavy some of this uh, stuff can be as we go into some of these concepts. Now, you see the line up there, or the sentence says, each dot is moving in a straight line. Do we believe that? Let's do one. Let's try this guy right here. Every one of those dots is moving in a straight line. And yet, they are working in harmony to be able to go into this endless cycle or circle going around. This is an important concept that we're going to run into over and over again in which everything we see as a straight line is in fact this endless cycle. We understand the endless cycles. The Big Bang is obviously the biggest one that we have in science. But we have the thing like the changing of the seasons, etc. Or, you know, you have the, uh, the birth, life, death cycle within, uh, within physical lives. And it just seems to be one straight line, and yet it's going through a seasoning, if you will. <clears throat> now, from a higher perspective, when, you, when you're seeing this, I mean, in 3D, we're seeing it just being round. From a higher perspective is what we're going to be taking a look at so many things tonight. I'm going to be giving you God on a chalkboard, as I like to refer to it, in which you're going to have visual examples of these spiritual concepts. Now, let's start with what was it like before the beginning? In the beginning, there was God, right? So if God is all there was in the beginning, and let's say this red dot is a representation of God, how do we know that red dot is moving? If all there is is God, and he's right there, there's no exterior <clears throat> person to sit there and take a look, no exterior perspective. God's right here, and he's moving around in effectively nothingness, if that's all he is, and so is God moving at all. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that what is it that caused God, who is complete in and of himself, as the first cause, what made him want to uh, create us? His free-willed souls, as the Casey readings say, uh, we were created to be his companions and co-creators. Companions and co-creators with God is why he put us uh, into existence in the first place. Now, did he just make us out of nothing or the dirt of the ground and all that? No. Casey says, and if you think of it, as above, so below, the best analogy I can think of is to be able to take the zygote. You know, you have the single cell that said, okay, the sperm and the egg got together and you now have life starting. Now, what happens after that? It divides in two. And then those two divide again and again and again and again. Well, let's make it easy. Let's go to the first one where it divides in two. Now you have two cells there. Which one of them is older? When you have four, which one of the four is the oldest? The reason this is an important concept is because it comes up in the Casey readings over and over again that we are eternal beings. That means we have always been and will always be. All right? We didn't have a beginning point like where the Bible talks about you know, creating Adam out of the dust of the ground. If you remember in the Bible, in Genesis, in the first chapter, I think it's 27, verse says that we were created in God's image. Well, that to me is spirit. And then it's like 11 uh, verses later in chapter 2 that Adam was created out of the dust in the ground. So the Bible even talks about two separate creations, one in spirit in God's image, and then 
God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Adam became a living soul as in this spiritual being was more or less like we do today when we're born our souls attach themselves to the physical body and so we wind up being a part of God just talking about that zygote uh, splitting up into into various cells we are all truly a part of God and each one of us each one of those cells was given our own separate consciousness and free will in order to be able to make our own choices <clears throat> now what was so important about that we take a look around the earth in these days and we go oh that was a bad idea what did what was God thinking <laughs> What did, I mean, how could that possibly be right? We see all the horrible things that go on. As I continue to go through this talk, please keep in mind those basic concepts the, that uh, we are in a childproof universe. We are these physical bodies just temporarily. The soul is eternal. It can't be hurt. You can't sin, do an unpardonable or unforgivable sin that cannot be fixed down the road. So... Nothing is eternal to be able to keep us away from God. So let's take a look at this concept more fully of saying, here's God all by himself, and he wanted companions and co-creators. Why do we think he did that? Well, let's take one step at a time. Let's say that this one dot, red dot right here, is the same dot that we were looking at in the previous uh, slide, and now I'm showing you a sine wave like you'd see as a, in a musical note or something. And so... Here we are duplicating God without having the free will of God. So I'm just trying to say, here's all, the, all these duplicating dots that are manifesting as a frequency right here, and they're doing exactly what God's telling them to do. They don't vary from what his directions are. It's almost like when you give a, a computer program or a robot some instructions, and it carries it out. And so it looks like God's moving around and doing his thing right here, and it's going exactly according to plan. But how long do you want to watch this? How long will that be entertaining? I mean, it's not entertaining to me, and I'm sitting here with a finite mind. In about 10 seconds, I'm done looking at that slide. Imagine being omniscient and omni omnipotent, having all power, all knowledge, and saying, what is going to be worthwhile for God to be able to put together to, in effect, be entertaining for him, to be a companion and co-creator for himself? Uh, uh, by the way, I do need to, I still have to remember a lot of folks haven't heard my background on this. I often refer to God using a male pronoun. There are a couple of reasons for that. It is not that I believe that God has a gender one way or another. God is genderless. We are genderless. But when you hear me using that pronoun, it's because I personally, when I try, especially in prayer and meditation, I wind up doing so much better and making a better connection with God when I think of the family connection that you have. Now, I could think of God as being my mother, and I can think of him as being the father, and it really doesn't make any difference. And when I was thinking about it, should I refer to God as mother? I said, I don't have a problem with that. But it might throw people off if you wind up using the gender pronoun in the female direction instead of the male. I'll go, well, why is God a woman? You know, so if you go with that, the reason that I default to God being a male, first of all, it's father, and then it's him, as in what Jesus said. I figured if Jesus said it, even if it was at that time, it was good enough for me. So I have no problem with thinking that it's Father, Mother, God, without gender, and the same is true of us. But uh, if you hear me using the male pronoun, it is not sexist in any way. All right, so what do we need to do from here to be able to make life more exciting? Let's go to a Casey reading for a moment. And talking about God the Father and his manifestations, Hence, be glorious in thine activity, joyous in thy service. Now, the Casey readings have a very interesting definition of what is glory or to glorify. And that is to be of service, the ability to serve. It's the only time I've ever heard that definition applied to that word is in the Casey readings. So if the definition of glory is the ability to serve, then what this Casey reading up here is talking about is there's never a time that we shouldn't be serving others and being happy about it. Every decision that we make should be in service to other people, considering the others around us and how we can be a service to them without being a doormat. I need to point that out because very often we leave that out. 
It isn't a, I'm just going to completely give of myself, give of myself, give of myself to others, others, others. And you have to say, there is an answer in which I can give of myself and I'm not stepping on myself. I'm not making myself a doormat because I'm as important as everybody else around me. So if you can be glorious, in other words, you can serve all the time and be happy about it and not be stepping on your self in the process, making a doormat out of yourself, I think this is what this reading is referring to right here. Now, I think probably one of the best examples that I have of this was a time that I thought I was going to be of great service and failed miserably. <laughs> I had the opportunity, a friend of mine was working at a charter school, and it was for at-risk kids, if you've ever heard that term. This was, this was a charter school that it was the last chance for these kids. Uh, to be able to get through their high school education. Because if they got thrown out of there, nobody else in Phoenix was taking them. And they wanted me to teach them math. Now, I was supposed to be teaching them algebra, which I understand algebra really well. And I uh, walked in there and found out that they couldn't do basic arithmetic. And yet, they're sitting there with this curriculum that says, okay, here's our uh, you know, quadratic equation formulas, and then we're going to move into geometry after that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, now we're trying to add 2 plus 2. Well, the problem is, is that when they get that lost in the class, that you lose their attention and then all hell breaks loose in there. Nobody, not only do they not pay attention to you, then they start talking to each other and then they're, I mean, it even gets so loud, it's ridiculous. Uh, one of the things, just as an anecdote to show you how frustrating it could be, every, I think I did this for three months. <coughs> From the very first day, I'm calling roll. I don't know any of these people, and I'm calling the names. And every single name of maybe 25 people in the class, I get five or six here's in answer to it. So I'd say, you know, John Doe, here, Jane Doe, here. And I'd get five or six here's on every one. I'm going, is this person really here? And I'd have to spend, I don't know, 20 minutes doing the roll because of the way this was going down. And I'm going, all right, they're picking on the new guy, and I can be patient with all that. Do you know that they never stop doing that for three months every single day? And I, I finally, I just, I wouldn't get angry, but I go, are you people five? How can this still be funny to you? You know, it was just amazing to me that, you know, well, we think it's funny. And I went, oh, okay, I don't know. So they were really, you know, they were getting, I couldn't teach them algebra, which was what I was there to do. I couldn't even get their attention. And then one day I said, you know what? I just took all that stuff and I set it aside and I went up to the chalkboard and I said, we're going to do a budget. I said, here's an article. It says that if you do not have a high school diploma, you can expect to average about $11 an hour is what your, you know, if everything were as it was then. And this is a few years ago now that you would average $11 an hour as your pay, assuming that you could get a job. And so we started doing the math up there. Of what is 40 hours a week times $11 an hour, and how much money do you have of, you know, at the end of the month? And then we started running a budget out there, and they could see how many, and I was getting the numbers from them. There were things that I was getting from high school students that I never thought would be in their budget. How about diapers? Oh my gosh, I mean, <laughs> that was really throwing me off. Okay, diapers. By the way, do you know that they're more willing to do without a car than they are without their cell phone? So the cell phone was the higher priority than trying to have a car. I'm going, don't you need a car to go to work? And they all kind of just shifted around, didn't say anything. Anyway, I did the budget, got down to the bottom line, and they were well short. Okay, you're short. You don't have enough money to pay your bills. Now what? Get a roommate. Okay, so we go back and redo the thing. And we run the numbers again, and they're still short. And now what do you do? What I caught, what, to me, the natural answer was, I guess I'd better get a high school diploma where I can make more money per hour. That wasn't it. Then they started to going, well, there's food stamps, and there's WIC, and there's Section 8. And, there, and I'm like, how do you people know about all this stuff? And the, and the one answer of trying to improve your education to be able to get a better paying job was not mentioned until I mentioned it. And they're going, nah. <laughs> and that was it. I mean, I, I followed through on the commitment to be able to get them through to the end of the semester, so I didn't leave the school stuck. But I w at the end of it, and they said, oh my gosh, thank you so much for helping us out, and, and, and you know, we'll call you, you'll be the first person that we'll call if we need somebody. And I said, please don't. 
I am not the person who can do what this is talking about. I walked in there with the best of intentions. I really thought I could make a difference. I thought I was going to be an excellent teacher of algebra. You know why? Because I sucked at it. When I first went into school and took algebra, I didn't get it at all. But I eventually did and went on to be able to take applied calculus in order to get the, you know, an MBA and no statistics and all that. So I got very good at math. But the problem there is that if you don't want to learn it at all and you run into what I did, I had no joy in being a service even if I had talent for doing what it was that I had hoped to be able to serve to do. So sometimes you have to find that you kick the dust from your feet, not in any way condemning the people that were there, but knowing I'm not the person to be able to reach them and to, and to help them out in that case. All right, so let's move on and, and go back to when we last left our hero, God. He was uh, in his universe and trying to figure out how to make the most of it. And so he's, uh, it, let's go ahead and, and again, we're just using these dots over and over again. And now I have a lot of dots that are moving. And they're moving not just this one sine wave out there, but if you can see well enough into this graphic, I know it's hard in the lighting in this room, but you have an infinite number of dots that are moving together in sequence in a perfectly symmetrical manner right here. And there are, in a lot of ways, this to me is beautiful. I mean, you know, you, you, if you were to actually encounter this out in space, you go, oh, wow. And you'd be trying to, uh, you know, follow up what the patterns are and all the shapes. I mean, I, I start to see a little star bus uh, cluster burst here, here, and here, as well as the one there in the middle, and it's echoed around. And I can see the symmetry of, like, music going on, even though we're just talking about dots marching across the stream, uh, screen here. But again, this is what it would be like if you were to create a whole lot of souls that don't have their own free will, their own mind, their own choices to be able to make here. It's just a whole lot of different parts of God following through on exactly what God's told those things to do. And so this is the kind of result that you have. But again, how, how long do you want to take a look? As beautiful as you can find, or all the beauty that you can find in this graphic as it marches through, how long will that be holding your attention? How long will it uh, make life worth living and worthwhile for you? So let's go to another PC reading here. For unless we use that that we know, we may not comprehend or use that which may lead for the next step. So you wind up, the idea being, have you ever heard that thing of knowledge not uh, lived is sin? Well, I think this is referring to that. It's not that it's sinful to not use the knowledge. What it's talking about is saying that if you, if you do not wind up working with that that you understand right now, you aren't going to be able to understand how to move forward to be able not only to help yourself, but to help others as well. How can you teach what you don't understand? And so it's saying, if you're not getting what you have right now, how can you be given the next step? Now, do we think God is withholding the next step or any information from us at all? And in my opinion, no. As a matter of fact, we're getting every bit of information that the universe holds at every single moment. I mean that. It's just, what are we open to being able to receive? Luckily, if our finite minds have this time and space, and you've heard that you know, statement that says time is God's way of keeping everything from happening to us at once, humorous as that is, it's absolutely true. Everything appears in a sequence that we're able to handle. But I'll give you an example of, of uh, something that, that happened to me that made this so clear at one time. I know a few of you have heard this story before. Uh, the uh, Logo Center. I believe they're, yeah, they're still doing a one Sunday a month uh, service here in the area, but back when they were blowing and going, and they were a, a really uh, active organization, and the lead minister, uh, Herb and Ann Perrier, Ann was a gifted psychic. And she was trying to teach other people to be psychics, to go into an altered state, and there was a, uh, a, a one of the applicants, if you will, was being tested, and they used me. So I go walking into the room, here's this psychic being tested, and Anne is sitting there as well. Anne's able to see auras. And so when uh, 
uh, the guy's name was Bill. So when Bill is sitting there and he's doing the altered state thing and, when, and questions are being asked of him, uh, one of the questions that came up had to do with what was a past life between myself and Bill and one other person in the Logo Center. And uh, what was interesting is not so much what his answer was right then, <clears throat> but what Ann saw in response to that. When the question was asked about the past lives, she saw as an auric pattern above him this big white tube of light descend down from the top and all these little tiny icons that would look like a Roman soldier here and maybe an Atlantean incarnation and maybe a, a female incarnation over here and, and something as a businessman and something as a, a young child and maybe a handicapped or something like that along the way. You could see all these little iconic characters that were coming down from this white light and actually going onto his head and sliding off. And yet there was one that had to be, had to do with a Civil War incarnation that she saw go down and actually went in, was absorbed in through the top of the skull. And that, after it happened, was when he started answering the question and talking about what involvement I had prior to the Civil War in the United States. She visually saw what was happening. He was getting every single incarnation that I had ever had given to him, and yet, almost like a, a, uh, a magnet, he drew the one into his consciousness that was actually an answer to the question that was being posed at the moment. You all following me on that? So here we are talking about, we're getting every, all knowledge is available to us at all times. You've probably heard of the Akashic Records. A record of everything that has ever been and will ever be is always there for us, and the way that it seems to work is that we throw out a vibration, and the vibration in the form of a question attracts the answer if we're open to it. And that's exactly what happened to Bill in this case in being able to answer the question in this reading. But that didn't mean that all of the lifetimes weren't there available to him if that was indeed the vibration that he's sending out, give me all of his lifetimes. Boom, all of a sudden they're there and they would have all gone into you know, the conscious mind to be able to relate if that's what we were going for. So it's, it's a interesting process to, when we're talking about if we don't comprehend, we can't go to the next step. I was talking about uh, math before in trying to, to uh, help those kids in that career success high school. That was the name of it. And, the, uh, and there they were, they didn't even have basic arithmetic skills. And they have me trying to teach them algebra and then geometry after that. The, uh, the problem is, is how could they possibly comprehend what I was there to teach them when they didn't have the fundamentals? So it's, a, I mean, math going up one level at a time is just very similar to the lessons that we need to learn in order to play well with others. So here's another couple of examples of what happens when the universe winds up having changes. All right, so now we're, we're looking at this and you're seeing where there's actual patterns that are establishing, the one on the left and the one on the right here operating in different ways, but I'm just trying to give you an example of what happens when patterns change. You can tell this one is actually rotating things around, and they're not all rotating together in unison. There's a different cycle, and every once in a while it lines up into straight lines, or then it starts to look like a helix that's going around and so on. And then over here you can see that if you were to think of each one of these things, and it, and it lines up like that, where you can see a line going down, and then it starts over again, so that you can see if each one of these lines is a linear path for an individual going forward into eternity, and as we start to go forward like that, the universe is rearranging itself all the way around to keep this consistent pattern there. You see what I'm getting at? We're still not dealing with free will. You're saying, but if we have everything on its own straight line path into this tubular, you know, eternity out here, then the rest of the universe winds up readjusting itself automatically to keep the symmetry and balance where you see all the circles coming up right there. Or you see the helix or the straight lines appear in the other one. Again, that's what it winds up doing. These are the kinds of combinations that you can have even without free will in order to be able to get this sort of thing done. Well, it, it, believe me, what winds up being kind of interesting on this is that what it, all of this stuff is moving forward here, what if some of these were able to move backward, like we do? 
<laughs> you remember in the Casey material, it's always talking about every choice that we make either brings us closer to or further away the, uh, God's unconditionally loving ways. So if every choice that we make is getting us closer to or further away from our goal, then you don't just have everything moving forward. Some of this stuff will be moving backward and others forward and so on. So it can get more interesting when you start having the uh, uh, free will involved. Now, let's go ahead and take another example in which we <clears throat> say, all right, we're going to create a, uh, a free will soul, but it's almost like a puppy dog. Let's say once again that the red dot is God, and you create the one soul out there, and you know, you ever taken your puppy dog for a walk, and he starts running ahead of you or behind you, but he's not leaving your side very much. He's just, you know, moving around a little bit, but he's always going to be right there with you. Even with free will, if that's the, uh, the other soul is out there, is just going to remain attached to God's hip. So you don't wind up, if they have free will to be able to do what they want to do, What's, it, what's the free will soul going to do? Go ahead and leave God somewhere out there and then he's on his own? How many of you would like to go see Disneyland alone? I mean, it's, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a foreign concept. Actually, I've been in that park alone, but different reasons. And the, uh, I, I grew up a mile away from Disneyland is why. <laughs> I got there a lot meeting people inside or whatever. But the, uh, the point being is, is that when we're trying to go out there and enjoy life in the universe, we want to share it with somebody. And that's just our natural inclination inside. And so if we wind up having this kind of a relationship where there's just two, uh, you know, there's God and his uh, beloved creation right there, even with free will, if there's just one other, now we start to understand why there would be more than one. Now, where would you stop? If you're God, how many souls do you make? Two, three, four, how long do I keep going? At what point do you stop and say, God, is, that's enough souls? To me, if you have an unlimited consciousness, unlimited in terms of omniscience, omnipotence, power, and, and knowledge, I don't think that there is an end to the number of souls that you create. Now, a lot of people go, how can there be an infinite number of souls? And of course, I would come back and say, how can you have infinite space? <laughs> how, how can you have an infinite lifespan? If you can go to infinity with all of these concepts, how come you can't say that there are an infinite number of souls? Is it because God's un, incapable of doing that? To me, if you're really following through and saying what God's not only capable of, but seems to like a lot of, making an infinity of everything, that there would be an, an infinite number of souls. Unfortunately, no one ever asked Edgar Casey that question. So we don't necessarily have his answer to it, even though others do theorize, uh, other psychic sources do theorize that there are an infinite number of souls out there. Okay, so we're talking about God trying to share with other free will souls, and if you only have one, you, uh, you definitely don't stop there. It, it winds up just being monotonous, if you will, going through and through with just one other. So let's try another reading here. Let thine heart be glad in the things thou hast seen in thine experience of the glories of the Father through the Son and the lives of those that hast contacted day by day. For these are but not. Will thou, wilt thou keep thine heart singing? Keep thine life pure. Keep thy ways as his ways. For he loveth and protecteth and guideth and directeth those that call on him in faith and not for themselves alone. So what he's talking in the Edgar Casey reading here, what it's trying to say is, is that our greatest joy, our greatest happiness, the way that we were created was not only to be of service at all times, but to be joyous in the service that we have and that we keep with God's unconditionally loving ways, play well with others in everything that we do. And how do you wind up being able to do that? It all comes down to this last line here and not for themselves alone. Because that's where you wind up committing the one, and by the way, it, Casey says there really is only one sin. We can figure out another, way, you know, many ways of describing it, but the sin is selfishness. It, at a point where we decide that there is an us and a them to be able to make a decision about, and you say, sorry, sucks to be you, I'm going to be me in this case, and I'm going to come out ahead on this. Now we've gone ahead and made a decision for ourselves alone and separated ourselves from understanding the oneness of, uh, of all souls together. And what happens when we are able to go ahead and see things like this? 
This is what, uh, you know, in the past year, uh, Charles Thomas Casey, Edgar Casey's uh, grandson, passed away. And uh, he was the, the last uh, direct male uh, descendant. Uh, he, Charles Thomas wound up having a couple of daughters. But the last male descendant of the family. And did he have any psychic abilities? I've asked him that before uh, in the past. And I said, have you been able to do anything? And he, and he kind of laughed and he related one of the stories of, uh, I'm sure there were many, but this is one in particular. He was in a hurry because he, in fact, it was a board meeting. I was on the board for the ARE and he was, he was telling me, just most recently I was coming to this board meeting and I needed to pick up a suit at the dry cleaners and I was going to change into it when I got here. And I went to the dry cleaners and the guy knew who I was, but the way the system was, if I didn't know what the ticket number was, you know, you have all those clothes up there on the rack and it has the automated thing that just keeps going around. He didn't know which one of them was mine, and he'd have thousands of them to look through to be able to try to find it. And so there he is going, uh, oh, I don't have the ticket. And the guy goes, to tell you the truth, I don't know how to operate the computer here to be able to, you know, backtrack and get your ticket number. He goes, I can try to call the owner and see if I can get him on the phone to walk me through it. And Charles Thomas is like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late. And he was running late at that point. And he just stopped for a moment. And he goes, give me just a second. He went ahead. He sat down in the chair. He got still quiet and said, what's the number? And it came to him. And he was able, he said it was about a five-digit number. And he was able to give the guy the five-digit number. He punched it up and it wound up being his suit that he needed at that time. Now, he said probably the best part of that is the guy says, oh, you're going to scare me to death if you ever do that again. <laughs> the guy behind the counter is like, how in the world would you ever know that? But the point being is that when we absolutely believe that, there, that we can do this, that there is no impediment between you know, us and the Akashic Record to that kind of knowledge, there just isn't a problem with being able to do that. That's not a surprise to anyone. It winds up being in a course. I'll give you one of the examples that happened in my own life. I, uh, I was very young. I was maybe 9, 10 years old. And I'd gotten very sick. My pattern when I was a, was a child was I would get sick for probably three or four days at a time. And I mean a fever that would go up to 103, 104 degrees and a sore throat I couldn't hardly swallow. And my mother was having Edgar Casey study groups at her home at that time. And they were meeting on that particular uh, night. And one of the gentlemen, in fact, he used to live out here. He's passed away now, but uh, used to live out here by the name of John Miley and was really gifted with laying on of hands. And he offered to be able to come back, you know, and, and try to do a laying on of hands with me. I was asleep, which I was not happy when I got woken up because when you feel like that all the time, you do not want to be awake. You'd rather be asleep. My mother said, well, we're going to try to do this healing prayer. All you have to do is just lay there. I said, okay, that I can do. And so they, he puts his hands over me, over, over my throat area, and I actually started to feel heat in that area. And I just, wow, you know, I can feel the heat coming off of his hands. I didn't say anything, but I was just feeling it. And so I was just, you know, lying there and going, hmm, okay. Uh, after five, ten minutes went by, he says, I think that should do it. And my mother says, uh, so how do you feel? And I was like, okay, I've got to swallow. So, and it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt at all, not even a little bit. I mean, it, this healing was actually instantaneous. It wasn't like it just cleared up over the next, you know, six hours, three hours, five, it wasn't even five minutes. It was immediate after the laying on of hands had happened. And I said, uh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Now, the most important thing about that story was not the instant healing that I had. It was their reaction when I said that. Their reaction was, well, of course. Do you know what a difference that is instead of a, oh, my God. <laughs> if you act surprised, if you act like, I can't believe that this just happened and start, you know, jumping up and down and all that, I go, oh, well, I guess we're all surprised that that took place. But it was a, oh, of course. That was exactly what I was supposed to expect to come out of this. Well, that's when you're able to sit down, get in the stillness for a moment, and be able to come up with your dry cleaning ticket number. You know, one other part of that story I don't think I ever pointed out uh, was that they had me uh, roll over onto my stomach, and he held his hands over my back, and I had, uh, I had a number of moles that were on my back at the time. 
and he was he says it's not that the moles are going to go away he goes but if they have a tendency toward cancer this will be able to help and so i could feel the uh the uh spots where the moles were on my back from the energy that was actually you know going to those specific spots that were on there so it, it was fascinating experience to go through that all right now let's watch what this thing does if we kind of think of this as being like atomic motions right here now that it's rebuilding think of these as being like you know you have uh, h2o in water so you have hydrogen a couple of oxygen cells and the things can break up you know when you have uh, evaporation and whatnot and then they can form other substances well let's say everything forms into h2o right here and then it splits off and you can wind up having some other compound and yet another compound in another direction and then it actually dissipates and this notice this is going to go over here into another atom altogether so now I'm starting to show the cycle of life it says if we're looking at this as being the atomic structure of the universe that everything is constantly in an evolving pattern yet still following the laws the physical laws of the universe as atoms would wind up split and forming exploding even reforming after that according to what the laws are again this is happening lawfully and not just because of free will going in one direction or another so I'm giving you a number of different ways of seeing how things occur here in the universe but we're still not talking about companions and co-creators so if we were going to uh, take this over that's uh, when we do take it over with our thoughts with our choices with the acts that we do we get cancer <laughs> That's, uh, that's what happens in the body. When the body is working perfectly, then it's in perfect unison like this. But if our thoughts become unloving, if they become selfish, if they start saying there's enough in them, you have discord in the body. You have a disease within the body that it doesn't work in this perfect accord. And that's exactly what cancer is. It's where souls not working in accord with each other create an us and them situation and then it starts to draw the rest of the body of the nutrients inside as a matter of fact in the Casey readings talks about almonds being a good prevention uh, at the time that we uh, you take a few almonds every day just raw almonds and uh, the readings say and the body will not be tempted toward cancer what interesting wording that the body would not be tempted toward cancer it means that the body with our thoughts if our thoughts are unloving if they're selfish that the body winds up being tempted to go in a direction that is not in perfect harmony out there now mind you I do want to make sure especially in the listening audience online almonds are not a cure for cancer they are meant to be preventative in nature I'll give you one more about my mother she ate almonds every day of her life my mother got diagnosed back in 2008 with acute leukemia which is cancer of the blood and after the doctor had gone away because I sure didn't want to talk about Edgar Casey in front of him but uh, I said mom you eat almonds every day of your life how in the world did you get cancer and she looked at me and she got this guilty look on her face she said remember when I was having all the dental trouble about a year ago and I had an upper plate put in you know she she had dentures in the top she quit eating almonds so there she had gotten 80 some odd years into her life never a hint of cancer the whole time and then bam it takes her just like that within the year after she quit eating almonds so preventative certainly works I guess we all go you know die according to something so that was as good a way to go as I could figure the way she took it <clears throat> now what is that to me I look at that and go this is kind of what it looks like when you got a whole bunch of an infinite number of free will souls coming at you and you let them loose in the uh, manifest universe you're going oh my gosh there's look at all this chaos and everything that's going on out here but I'll tell you I can watch that one for a little bit longer than I've seen those other very lawfully uh, symmetric you know uh, unfoldings that we've had out there so this is really to me I'm going oh boy I could try to pick out a lot of patterns in that it's a lot more interesting and look at each one of them to you know it, even though there's just three colors going on in here it does seem like there's a lot more variety of what's going on and much more representative of what the universe is all about so if it doesn't have that symmetry and it's not following the laws perfectly and it's not giving us this uh, perfectly ordered thing that we have been seeing up to that point is what is it that God finds so 
incredibly attractive about having us as his children. Well, let's go to this reading. Now, the Q&A is just that in paragraph 8 of this 26259, paragraph 8 starts with a question. What is meant by the soul must feed upon dead patience that it may grow into an abundant life? And that was the question asked by the person conducting the reading. The answer comes from Casey. For as given by him that is the light, the life, we become aware of our souls through patience. Then patience that is crucified of self in service to another is as dead in the sense of earth's activity and alive in the knowledge of the Father dwelling in thine service or thine activity through such experience. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm seeing when I read this is I, I constantly try to go to the uh, life of Jesus in order to be able to make sense of it. And I think, you know, we keep hearing, especially in the traditional Christian religions, that, uh, that we would not be able to make it into heaven had it not been for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And I'm thinking, did he, did he really have to bleed and did he have to die horribly? And, it, and, it, and I start looking at it from that point of view when I look at this reading and I think about the life of Jesus, I understand that what is it that we wind up learning through what dead patience is. In other words, Jesus was killed, you know, in, that human, uh, in the human body at that time. And yet, what does the Bible say happened in that process? Though he were a God, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. That to me is fascinating. If you are omniscient, omnipotent, if you are God incarnate on the earth, how do you learn anything? If you already know everything, how do you learn obedience through the things that you suffer if you've already attained the Christ consciousness? That one always threw me until I started to get this concept, uh, and I'll have a graphic here in a, in a second that will help to be able to explain this better. But he truly did a selfless act in obedience right then, right? He didn't have karma coming to him in which he needed to be crucified up there on the cross. He was perfect. He had, made, he had lived a perfect life. And so he didn't have anything coming to him, but he ch willingly put himself in harm's way to be able to teach all of us a lesson. If you make all of your choices in accordance with God's loving ways, humankind can throw its worst at you and you will still overcome it. All right, because he came back and he goes, you can even kill this body and I am still here and alive and well and you can't stop me from doing anything once you get to that point. So he demonstrated, you know, patience and obedience that he had uh, learned through the things that he suffered. And to me, that expanded God's manifestation of love and service for others. Now let's see what that winds up looking like in another graphic. Now let's assume that this is the extent, this outer circle right here, is the extent of the best that we have ever been able to manifest in, in any of the gifts of the Spirit. Let's say that we have patience, and we have fellowship, and we have service, and we have, you know, love, and we have uh, obedience as being like little slices of the pie, if you want to look at it like that, and say, and it's pushed the outer realm of manifestation, of God's manifestation within the universe to this level that we see right here. But guess what? What if he was able to manifest, to willingly put himself in harm's way, to choose to be able to be the perfect role model for us all, and that exceeded the outer limits of what anybody had ever been able to do through patience, through love, and obedience before, and suddenly that circle comes out to here, whereas up to that point, perfection had, had, was still perfect, but this is as far as it had been manifested. What if it went out here, then this line would come out here and there would be a whole new expanded realm of which God's manifestations of love would happen. Now, if you want to understand what the importance of that is, let me say uh, Roger Bannister. You know who that was? The guy, first guy that broke the four-minute mile. All right? Christopher Columbus. There were a lot of people that, it, it, when Bannister broke the, uh, the four-minute mile, do you know, I think it was 18 people did it in the next year. And they had gone how long up until that time? 
How long up until that time have they gone, you know, at least a hundred years as far as when they were measuring things accurately. So you go a hundred years, nobody breaks the four minute mile, he breaks it and 18 people within the next year can do it. Why? Because when he broke the four minute mile, he said, of course. <laughs> Everybody can go, oh my God, that's impossible. No, it's actually possible he did it. And if Jesus manifests obedience out to here, guess what that means? All of the boats get floated and all of us are able to manifest God's love in greater and greater ways all the way through it. So when you're seeing this, you're seeing all of the souls that are living and moving and having their very being within the mind of God right there. And if somebody goes ahead and does what Jesus did, you have just floated all the boats ever, ever higher because of the ability to be able to do that. So Jesus learning obedience through the things that he suffered makes a lot of sense to me when I look at it from this kind of a perspective. Where we last left off, it was with uh, paragraph 27 of 26251. When this is saying questions on group number five, the people that put these books together in the first place was called group one. And so they had a Virginia Beach area study group that was entitled, it was the fifth group that they had. And they were trying to find out, you know, as each group would run into problems, they were using Casey's uh, readings to be able to advise uh, Robert Ladd, who was the, the uh, one that was in charge of that group, as to the proper way to develop and handle this group. So whatever the, the challenges were within the group, they're saying, please tell this Robert Ladd how to be able to handle that. And his answer was, it has been experienced by this leader, Robert Ladd, rather than teacher, that it behooves him to first find himself and as to how and in what manner he may present same in his experience to those questions and tenets that arise in the minds of those that have been or may be interested in the thought or presentation of such lessons. Uh, I'll tell you, this is one that I, I've taken to heart from a long time ago. You, you, you know, for those of you that have been in here a lot, th there isn't a lot about my life that I don't share. <laughs> I'm constantly coming up with, you know, stories of application in my life or the, my poor unfortunate wife's life who I keep, you know, divulging that to everybody. And the, uh, in my family and, and friends and all of those around me. But I think very much that it's like this. That as opposed to trying to be a teacher, go ahead and sharing what the applications of these concepts have been in my life. I don't pretend to think that I am perfect in any way. I have that potential like all the rest of us do, and I'm trying to get there like the rest of us are, but I think that it's so much better to be able to show applications and real, I just shared one with you today where I failed miserably at being the math teacher for that career high school, uh, charter high school, right? I've tried my best, I did really bad, and I recognize that. And so our failures can be tre uh, training opportunities as well, as long as you understand that it's in terms of leadership and trying to say, here's where we'd like to go, but not I'm going to tell you this is how it's supposed to be. One of my favorite things is I do not ever remember Jesus saying, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> it was always the opposite. He said, you know, here's, here's how I am living. If you like what I'm doing and the way things, you know, way life unfolds, from what I'm telling you and the way I live my life, pick up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say, do it the way I'm saying it and pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So this really is saying that the problems, the challenges within the group are going to continue as long as he tries to be a teacher of the things that he's not trying hard enough to be able to apply in his own life. We don't have to be perfect at it, but we do have to be making the attempt. He has to first try to find himself in order to be able to to help the group through with its questions and its challenges. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a little two-dimensional one and we'll go on from there. You remember, it, it, this is as close as I could get. You remember the game of Pong? If it was just sitting there and it just had that little square ball that would go from this side and the second it exited from over here, it came back in from the left and went across again. Well, it's similar to what you're seeing. I know this is disappearing before it actually gets out the side, but that's the limitation of the graphic that I found. But just, if we're looking at this, and we're saying, okay, if it's entering from the left, why 
as soon as it goes out to the right, does it come back in from the left again? I want to say that that winds up being real similar to what it is in the, in the universe. I'll just pick up this. Here's our white piece of paper that we have right here. Why, when it exits here, does it wind up entering here if it's traveling in a straight line? So if I was showing you the white piece of paper right here and this thing is going directly across, how do I make that work? See what I'm talking about? It's traveling in a straight line, and yet it's making a whole lot of sense that it would exit from this side and enter in from over there. Now, I can make that a whole lot clearer in a moment with the next graphic that, uh, that would come along if you were to make a tube out of that piece of paper. Now, watch this. You have your flat piece of paper. It turns into a tube, and then... Now, what are we looking at here? Because if we have an infinite plane, and this, this plane goes on forever, and you turn it, you'd still have these open ends. The only way that you can have an absolutely infinite universe in terms of time and space is when both, all four edges, wind up being connected, as this one is showing you here. So you go ahead and say, okay, at least this side comes in from that side. This makes sense. But until that end and that end come together, you do not have infinite time and space. And the fact is, is that it doesn't really wind up being infinite. There is just a certain amount of ground that we cover. It just gets bigger. Remember back to that circle with the red, red circle around it and Jesus made that circle bigger? That's what's happening. We're just getting to work on a bigger player field. By the way, that, uh, the last thing that looks like a donut, if you're used to uh, mathematical terms, that's called a torus, T-O-R-U-S. So when that turns into a torus right there, we now have infinity around this way and infinity around this way. And that's why I'm, I'm talking about going into three dimensions. Now, here's an interesting one from the Casey readings, and I don't pretend to be able to explain it further than this. But in our finite minds, we see infinite time and space. And in fact, what we are interpreting that as is God's infinite love and mercy. God's infinite love and mercy, there's so much of it, it would overwhelm us. We only accept it as being infinite time and space. And what does that mean? That means that in his love and mercy, we have these infinite number of ways to manifest ourselves in any way that we wind up choosing. And then it goes on in a very exciting way forever and ever. Now, this is just one dimension. What does it look like if you were to add more dimensions to it? That you have layers upon layers upon layers. And this goes on infinitely in both directions because what we're talking about is now we saw the torus with a cross section of it and we see that there is an infinite number of dimensions that can keep getting smaller and smaller. And notice that they tend to cross over each other at particular points. Just as an aside, that could be where you wind up seeing things from other dimensions. You could wind up seeing a ghost, for instance. And a ghost sighting would wind up being, here's the physical dimension and here's an astral dimension, and you happen to be at that point where, and so is the other ghost at that particular point, and you can physically wind up seeing them even if you're not a psychic individual that's able to tune in to another dimension. You can just be in average, not psychic at all individual and have this kind of an experience and be able to see what most people would call supernatural. That's just a visual representation of it, not saying that it winds up being a donut or a torus or whatever that causes that to happen. But let me go a little bit deeper as far as what the KC readings say. KC readings say within this system that we are entrapped in, this solar system, there are uh, eight dimensions. Now, the way that I interpret that is that there are seven chakras, seven spiritual centers within the body, if you're used to, uh, say, the Sanskrit or Hindu uh, way of looking at the kundalini or the um, endocrine uh, glands within the body. Now, if you have those seven spiritual centers or chakras within the body, and that's how the, Casey says, that's how the soul plugs in to the physical. That's how we're able to perfectly manifest within the human form. There are seven planets within our solar system that are not planets at all, but actual three-dimensional representations of the dimensions that we go to in between our lives here on Earth. All right? 
So if you were to go, and it's actually very similar to what Greek and Roman mythology talks about. If you're going to the realm or dimension of Venus, you would be working on things that have to do with love or jealousy, that sort of thing. If you have a real problem with war, you would go into a dimension that is represented by Mars. Sound very similar to mythology in Greek and Roman times. What it was, there is an intuitive understanding as they made these stories up essentially, since they aren't, actu they aren't accurate as far as that there are these beings that are the gods and goddesses at that time, but at least they understood the energy behind each one of those realms that they were talking about. Now here's a, an interesting one if we're talking about how gravity affects both, uh, you know, like the moon causes the tides, the sun and the, and the uh, moon pulling on the Earth's uh, crust to be able to make the tides go in and out. What if our individual astrology works because of our individual rapport with those seven planets that are out there that plug into our seven centers. And the closer we are to the moon, the more it has a drawing force on us. Well, each one of us can wind up having a different, and I call it vibration or rapport with each one of those dimensions that causes one of us to react in one way and one of us standing right next to the other person because we have different experiences in those dimensions to react in a very different manner. I'm not going to go very deeply into that, but I, I want to make it clear that it's not just dimensions that are there, that we're even talking about the physical laws of gravity can wind up being representative of how things can affect us in a physical body, even if they're in another dimension. Okay, so uh, the, by the way, in my own thinking is that we have those seven planets that representative of the seven centers, and the eighth one, I, I have, uh, just from what I've seen in the Casey readings, I'm going to say is the sun. And it's interesting that it's S-U-N, the sun, and then it's S-O-N, as in, in talking about the light. Let there be light. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the light. And I almost feel like that that's representative that each one of the systems, uh, solar systems that are out there, that there must be some kind of a connection between the stars that are the anchor, if you will, from this or that. And one of the reasons I bring it up is they say that the soul Jesus came from the system of Arcturus, if you've ever heard of that. It's a star, you know, a ways off. And so it came from the Arcturus system. I'm going, okay, we're only talking about the star over there, and you know there's got to be planets running around it. I think there's almost like, a, like an underground railway, if you will, that makes it uh, traveling from one star to another. As far as saying that the eighth dimension is the ability to be able to move from this solar system into another one. Again, I'm not going to go into that one too deeply, but if you're interested in that sort of stuff, it's just an interesting way of interpreting what the Casey readings talk about. Now, this is, is an interesting graphic to me because I think it very well shows what can happen when you have, let's call it eight dimensions. Now, let's say this box, this cube here, is talking about this solar system of eight dimensions. The dimension, the third dimension, is this disk that's right here in the middle. Now let's do two different ways that we can manifest in and around that disk. The, remember the straight lines that we were talking about as this thing rolls you know, through the thing? What if these are representatives of souls that are incarnate into the earth and living and moving and having their being within the physical body here on the planet earth? What does that leave with these little lavender guys running around there? Those are the souls that are enmeshed and trapped, can't get away from the earth. That would be all of us, but you're not in physical form. And so we live and move and have our being within this system that we're in right now. These little purple guys, lavender guys, are not exactly in physical bodies, but they are still hovering around. And the ones that are actually attached to the physical bodies are moving within uh, it, within three dimensions and enmeshed in the, uh, in the bodies themselves. So I think it's just interesting to, you know, to get another way of being able to hold on to this concept in your mind as, uh, as you try to you know, grab onto something to understand how this whole thing works. So that's what a torus looks like if it's actually turning, rotating. To me, it's like you know, all the galaxies are rotating around each other and they didn't even understand. I mean, for how long was it we thought everything rotated around the Earth, right? We had centuries like that. Then we started to understand, no, we're not the end-all, be-all of everything. And we understand that even our tourists, right here, if you will, is rotating within itself. Now, if 
we were to think that this is just a cross section of another torus, torus and another torus that that's a section of. Did you ever see that uh, the uh, movie Men in Black? They have a fascinating end to that. Do you know what it is? You remember the ending to that thing? They, ha they have this whole thing of, of saying that there was a galaxy that was sitting on the cat's, uh, it was just like a marble or something, it was sitting there on the cat. And so they wind up having the, uh, they said an entire galaxy is sitting inside of this little glass marble. And so that was what they were all after. And then suddenly you start getting this shot at the end where you pull back. And then you're pulling back from the planet, and you're pulling back from the solar system, and then you're talking about the Milky Way galaxy, and it pulls back until the Milky Way galaxy becomes a marble in which this alien picks it up and starts playing marbles with it. All right? Now, I didn't want to show that clip because I could probably get in trouble for that. <laughs> but it, it, when you wind up thinking about how much, you know, I mean, we can't even imagine what the, the framework of a, you know, the size that when a, the Milky Way galaxy becomes a marble to a being, but, you know, that was really the kind of thing that they were getting across there. The idea being that there is an infinite number of ways that we could go out to a macro point of view. And did you ever see the Monsanto exhibit? This was decades ago over in Disneyland. But the Monsanto exhibit over in Disneyland, it's now Star Tours, and what you go in there and it, and it uh, projected you or shrunk you down into a snowflake. I don't know if you ever saw that, but if you went to Disneyland back in those days, it's fascinating. So you're sitting there and in the first room you go in and you see snowflakes are just looking gigantic. And then as you go in deeper and deeper, you realize that when you get to the inside of the nucleus of the, uh, the hydrogen atom, it looked just like the cosmos. Like you were sitting inside the Milky Way out in the middle of space and you're seeing all the quarks and whatnot you know, moving around outside and you're going, I'm in the uh, ultra microscopic level here and it looks just like it does in three dimensions in the Milky Way. So you have an infinite number of directions to be able to go smaller or larger and there's no limit to either one of them. Now the Casey reading, please discuss how and what are the manifestations of the Father. So from a spiritual standpoint, you know, we don't talk, uh, you know, the best way I can get this across is they uh, asked how many lifetimes that Jesus had on the earth. The answer from the Casey readings was 30. I'll give you a few of them. There, I think he gave 12. Uh, Joseph in the coat of many colors, Joshua, Enoch, Melchizedek. Uh, it, it, there were plenty of others, but I'll, uh, Adam, <laughs> of course Adam. What's that? That's not one he gave, but I do believe that is one of them. Yeah, it's, uh, it's well known that that was probably one of his incarnations. Uh, the Pharaoh Akhenaten was the first of the Egyptian pharaohs that actually believed in a monotheistic uh, god, as opposed to all of the gods, just saying there's only one. But the, uh, it, what was interesting was the follow-up of that, of the 30 lifetimes, which were the most important? Casey's answer to that was not giving them exactly. He goes, important as humankind counts such, or as showed the greatest spiritual growth for the soul. Now, what is more important is, are we immortalized, you know, in the Bible, in history? And, you know, I gave you a lot of famous incarnations that, uh, that Jesus had been right there, and yet the implication is, is that the ones that we record in history were not the ones of the greatest soul growth for him as a soul. And so the spiritual perspective is, how, what are the manifestations of God? The fruits of the Spirit, when we're gentle, when we're kind. Now, loving word, patience, hope, persistence, and above all, consistency in thy acts and thy speech. Be ye glorious. Remember, being able to serve in thine activity, being joyous in thy words. For happy is the man that knoweth that his life bespeaks that the Son and the Spirit of truth directs the words and the activities of his body. All right, so that's what true happiness is when you literally get to the point where you're saying, if somebody were to sit there and eulogize you, and I mean, how many people do you know they're going to say, all I can think of when I think of this person is gentleness, kindness, love, patience, hope, persistence, and so on. I, that'd be quite a eulogy, wouldn't it? And so if you're thinking of what it would be like if and when all of us eventually get there, because we will, 
what does life look like? Can you imagine? I mean, you know, we have all of these secret meetings. I, I used to be the uh, executive director of, of Unity of Phoenix here for about three years. And we'd meet in this very room. And uh, we would have these board meetings. And we wouldn't let other people in. I wanted to let them in. I was thinking, what in the world are we going to talk about in here that we don't want to talk about with our congregants? You know, I, I mean, isn't that why we're doing this? But it was, it, there was this level of secrecy. Well, think about in government. They have, this is secret and top secret, and this is for your eyes only, and if I tell you this one, I'm going to have to kill you. I mean, they have all these levels of secrecy that, and, and, uh, that have to go along with certain kinds of information, and that there's an us and them as far as who's allowed to see it. Imagine if everything that you discussed, even how you're going to interact with other countries, you could have them sit right there and listen to you talk about it because you're that transparent. How would that ever work? You're going, well, you can't do that. I'm saying, yes, you can, because every single thought that you have is trying to figure out how in the world do we work this out so that it's the best for them and the best for me at the same time and the best for everybody else that's involved. What do you have to hide if that's the way that you are conducting your life, your thoughts, your business, your conversation? And that's eventually the way it's going to be. And it's also when we understand that it's not that way, we understand why we're in time out, enmeshed and entrapped here on the earth until we learn how to play well with others in order to be able to get to that level. I'd love to get there. I know I'm not either. All right, now here's an interesting one in which I've been talking about infinite space, but what about infinite time? The thing I like about this graphic is that we have this little clock. Now, it's going backwards, but <laughs> if we have this clock that was counting out time, look at how it is adding to the skein, S-K-E-I-N, the skein of time is adding to space. It's adding these different, you know, it's making it longer as it goes, as it travels back. Into the, uh, if you can see the way that that's supposed to be, it's adding a new level here on the outside as it goes there on the left as time elapses. Now, again, it's, a, it's all a... Uh, a graphic in order to be able to get that concept across. But here we are thinking about infinite space going back and it takes time in order to be able to, uh, to go through that. So I, I think it's, um, it's really trying to say this is like God before he said let there be light, he's going and imagining saying all right I'm building my architect plans here, what do I think it's going to be like? and then you envision it perfectly out here, and then you execute, and the plans that you had in your mind become manifest in a 3D or a manifest universe using matter instead of just energy in order to do that. So this is kind of a representative of what it takes in order to be able to add time and space together and watch it bring a new manifested product out. Now here's where it gets a little heavy. <laughs> I'm going to go through what it's like to experience the different dimensions. Uh, has anyone in here um, heard of the book called, and it's a movie now too, called Flatland? F-L-A-T, Flatland? It's a, it's, the book's over 100 years old. But it's a, it takes the perspective of a two-dimensional being, and he gets to hear about the wonders that there is actually a third dimension out there. I won't go into that one too much, but I will describe the concepts that they have inside. You have the zero dimension. What does a zero dimension, now each one of these is going to wind up saying the next higher dimension sees things as we see the dimension before it. The zero dimension has nothing to see before it. It just thinks, I am it. I am God. I am all there is. And even if you try to talk to me and I hear you, I'm going to think how incredibly wonderful I am because I'm able to envision that there are other entities and beings out there even though I know there aren't any. And so that's the zero dimension being right there. Now, I made this into line segments because you have the one dimensional being in which you have the width if you will, going, a, uh, going across like that. And these are different beings. That's three different souls right there. Now, what do they see when they look at each other? If I were to just hold a pencil out here, and I held it, you know, so that the point or the eraser end was aimed at you, you would only see a point, wouldn't you? It'd look very much like that. So these beings, when they look at each other, are only able to see a point, And they know that they're there, and they communicate back and forth. All right, so what happens when you, instead of the width, we have the length to go along with the width, and now you have a two-dimensional being. 
When this uh, uh, form right here runs, let's say, into another square over here, what do they see? They actually see lines. Now, you can see if you're only, if you take that piece of paper and you put it on its side, and all you're able to see is just the edge of it, then you say, and I have three different lengths here, I can say this one could actually be a triangle, that one could be a circle, and that one could be an octagon, and you wouldn't know. All you know is what you'd see when you turn the thing sideways. So if I had a stop sign up here and turned it flat to you, how would you be able to tell what that shape was if that's all you saw was the edge of the thing? So these two-dimensional beings see each other in the one-dimensional view as we have it right now. Now you go to three dimensions in which you have length, width, and height. And now you have all three of those dimensions coming through. And what do we see right there? Now we're thinking we see length, width, and height, correct? But we're really kind of seeing everything from a two-dimensional standpoint as far as what's in front of us right there. And what I'm going to do is try to give you an, a, a way of being able to understand the fourth dimension, which is time. All right. Now, here's what happens in this book and movie Flatland. When they try to talk to this guy, he's just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's wonderful that uh, I can, I'm so great that I can make it seem like other people exist. So he's kind of hopeless. But what, what happens when the two-dimensional being comes over here and starts talking to them, they think they're hearing a ghost because they don't see him. Well, the problem is, is he inserts himself in there, in, in between these two, and all they see is a dot. They're going, wow, you're appearing and disappearing. He goes, not really, I'm seeing all of you. So he actually goes in there and pokes it. And he pokes him from the inside. And he's going, how are you able to poke me from the inside? This seems to be unreachable because the only way he thinks you can reach him is to go that way or to go that way. So when he comes out and he goes, boom, like that, he goes, oh my God, you poked me from the inside and it freaks him out. Well, the same thing happens here in two dimensions. The three-dimensional being comes along and just puts a point right there in the middle and he gets poked from the inside and he's going, I don't understand. How in the world are you able to do that? Well, when we see three dimensions and we start trying to think of how are we getting poked from the inside by a fourth dimensional being, it doesn't work that way. If we see a cube, if you add another dimension in its time, what you wind up with is a hypercube, or in the case of a sphere, a hypersphere, which means there's a cube, and a cube around that, and a cube around that, and a cube around that, and it keeps going like that. And what those are, are, are perceptions of time. This is one moment in time, this is the next moment in time, the next moment in time, and so on, each one of the cubes being represented one by another, or the same thing with the sphere. We don't get poked in the middle as we understand it. What happens if you have a being that is not limited by uh, time, linear time and space as we are right now, they're able to appear at any point. In other words, I could have somebody show up you know, in the past or in the future and just disappear and then all of a sudden three seconds later they're there because they don't have a limitation of time out there, so to, so to speak. So that's the, uh, the fourth dimension winds up being uh, time. The fifth one is space and I can't even go there. So I <laughs> won't even try to go there. But if you can understand how, and the interesting thing about the, the book Flatland is there's a three-dimensional being trying to open the eyes of the two-dimensional beings. And yet when the two-dimensional being starts expanding his consciousness and saying, well, that means there's a fourth dimension. And the third-dimensional being says, oh, no. No, no, I'm it. I'm the end all. <laughs> and there's nothing after that. And so obviously we know that's not the case. But it is funny to see, you know, that we, we will make life that uh, limited for ourselves to constantly think we're the absolute truth and understand how things are over anything else. Now, what happens when you understand a different or a spiritual view of things that we begin to see life in a much different way. Instead of it just being the static cube, that you would see here or here that just sits there by itself. One of the nice things that we have in life is you see the top of this box right here and then the sides of this box turning like that. I would want to say this is what it's like to see cause and effect. This is what it's like to say if you want love in your life, you need to be loving. If you want friends, you need to be friendly. And so you're able to see that when... <laughs> When you do one thing, you have this mirror reaction. Now, the mirror is, you know, life itself showing you what you get. When I turn like this, 
this is the exact you get that equal and opposite you know other side reaction in order to be able to get things to happen that is the real advantage of being here on the earth plane because let's see what it's like if you don't have the limitation of a form right there let's say that you don't need to eat you don't need to sleep you don't need to even live inside of a house and have a job and all of that you can just show up and play with everybody you just show up hey we're gonna have a good time and if things start to get really rough for you go um, I'm not getting along with these people I'm out of here and then you go to the next place and you start running into some other folks and you find out oh, I'm not getting along well with them either and I'm gonna get out of here and you go to the next place and you find out because you're still being this person that's not cooperative that you're still seeing that there are some people greater and lesser that there is an us and them and you don't get along with them either the problem is is that when you can constantly run from one situation to the next and not have to face yourself and say I'm the problem here you can get lost forever because there's an infinite number of places to continue to run to so what is so incredibly loving about entrapment or enmeshment in the earth plane is first of all cause and effect you find out that if I'm mean to them they're mean to me if I'm loving to them they're loving to me and the next thing is you don't get to go anywhere you're stuck in this body and you have to feed it or it dies and you have this natural preservation thing that says and I don't want to die and so therefore I'm going to stick around and guess what I'm going to have a much better chance of sticking around and having a better life if I go ahead and work within a family a familiar unit and in a village and all of us work pulled together and are cooperative in order to be able to protect ourselves and the elements or the wild you know the wilderness and the wild beasts that are out there and the next thing you know you're looking at the reason why we're in human form we can't just run off and be lost forever finding the next place to run away from we've got to sit here and work it out with each other and we have a body that needs to be fed and rent and mortgages that need to be paid and family obligations to follow through on and so on so there is a real advantage to being here in three dimensions so Casey says that in between lies we kind of go to school in these other dimensions to learn how to be able to play well with others and the earth plane is an in unique environment because of this linear time and space that we be that we are able to apply it to be able to try to go in there and live the things that we have learned in between lives and see how well we do with it because if we can and make it work here within the limited <clears throat> limited uh, three-dimensional consciousness we have we've got it cooked when it gets to the other side so when we're making uh, seeing the cause and effect what I'm showing you right here is this is the present moment and when we make a change and turn around make a turn for the better we're actually causing the universe to rearrange itself with everything that happens to us in the future all right you're seeing three dimensions here but the fourth dimension in terms of time of all of the things that are inevitably going to occur from that every time we make a change here the universe rearranges itself and it does it for each and every one of us this is not just one or a group consciousness it does it for all of us together as we make our own individual choices and somehow perfectly reorients itself to be able to accommodate the free will choices of each and every person one of the uh, uh, examples of this and I mentioned earlier Dr. Herb Perrier is actually was in charge of spiritual education at the uh, ARE or the headquarters for the Edgar Casey organization of Virginia Beach and he had come to a real pivotal time in his life in which he wasn't he wanted to run the ARE he actually uh, when Hugh Lynn was uh, passing on he chose to pass the mantle on to his son and Herb had really wanted it so he was was he going to stay with his beloved organization and not run it that was the way it, or it, but still be involved in it and the other thing was is he had decided that he really couldn't live with his wife anymore at that point and that he needed to divorce her and so he was in both of those pivotal times and he was procrastinating and he was he was still you know hanging in there and he's hanging in there with a the wife even though he wasn't happy with anything that was going on and he had a dream in which he was watching you know an overview of where he lived in Virginia Beach and the whole area with the ARE and all that and he watched one slide after another come over another it's almost like he was able to see a different 
uh, outcome for each choice. Okay, if I stay with the ARE and I stay with my wife, this will happen. But what if I stay with the ARE and divorce my wife and this will happen? And if I stay with the ARE and, and uh, you know, but I do it in some other capacity in some other place, then this thing will happen. So he was seeing all these alternative possibilities and suddenly everything just stopped and he literally heard it and saw in a word right in front of him, it said, decide. It was because it was this situation in which there were so many people that were hinging on his own decision as far as what he was going to do. Not just the ARE, not just his wife, not just the families, but think of all of us that are involved in the ARE and what kind of a difference it would make. He came, he moved out here and made a pretty big difference certainly in my life as far as being able to work with him and take advantage or be able to be that closely involved with a brilliant mind in the Casey material. So you wind up having this sort of a situation right there in which we need to make a decision and the universe will automatically reorder itself to everyone's highest spiritual good. And once you get to that point, you're able to say, if I have the Christ consciousness, it's not just a box or a, you know, a, a hypercube or a two, three, one, four dimensions out there. This is what you'll be able to do with any space point in time. In time, space, and consciousness, you can make everything get up and do a, you know, a dance move for you because that's what you are able to do when you are omniscient, omnipotent, and the way that God created us to be one with him. So it, it's a, a graphic is just showing you the way that you can see and manipulate time, space after you uh, achieve the Christ consciousness. This one's kind of interesting because as, uh, we don't think of ourselves as necessarily always cooperating with others. You know, we're all, each one of us is on that straight path going out and about. I don't know if you can see it well enough in the lighting here, but that's creating a five-point star. I, I would suggest that we understand that as we are living our lives, if we are doing so with love, with kindness, with gentleness, with patience, with cooperation in our hearts, that even though it seems we're just traveling our own path out there, we're literally creating beauty in harmony with everybody else that's acting in accord with that. We don't see the kind of beautiful pattern that we're creating on the earth when it's just us, that one dot that's moving back and forth. But in concert with all the other people of a like mind that are moving according to how we live and move and have our being within the mind of God, this is a beautiful, harmonious way to be able to get by in life. And we need to understand if we have the faith in, our, uh, in, in that things are well in hand and that it is a friendly universe, that this is how everything's working out. Now, I love dogs and I love this graphic, so I just put it in there. So I <laughs> but to me, this is one of the perfect manifestations of God. You know, it, it, when we... Uh, it, talk about Philippians uh, 2.5, I believe it is, in which uh, Jesus was God incarnate, and that uh, Paul was talking about that Jesus finding was God, was indeed God, and finding himself in the form of man, even though he was God, made himself obedient unto death. That's a paraphrase of what the Bible's saying right there. But I would almost say, that that's very applicable to where a dog's coming from. Because any creation, any of God's manifestations, and you can say, God finding himself in the form of a dog, even though he were a God, even though us, dogs, any kind of animal uh, life form out there is in fact a, a uh, part of God, is just going to make himself obedient unto death. If you have a, a beloved pet in your family, you certainly understand they live to make you happy. They live to be able to, you know, just be right around, be with you at any point, to be able to uh, uh, just coexist with you at that time. I think it's a great way to be able to look at it and say, this is God in front of me being really happy to just hang out with me. And it, uh, it, it improves your self-esteem. It gives you a better perception of how God actually sees us and recognize that there's no ego in that because it's true of every single one of us. God thinks of us as being that special and really does want to hang out with each and every one of us into eternity because of the delightful souls that we are when we're manifesting our free will in accord with his loving ways. And if I gave this talk in the 1960s, these would have been my graphics.
<laughs> so it is always a matter of the, uh, the time that you were born in right then. So that's it.